uh, Abhinan C, uh, currently a product engineer at uh, Stolby team in UST Global. Uh, we are uh, working on uh, building a travel platform uh, to uh, um, uh, change or modernize uh, our booking experience to the uh, users. And I'm also part of uh, Trivandrum Python community, organizing a few local regional Python events. And also I volunteer at Kerala Police Cyberdome uh, to uh, build dark web based uh, tools for them. So uh, let's uh, go and talk about event-driven architecture. We have heard a lot about events. Uh, there are uh, events are everywhere. Event driven architecture is everywhere. But what what exactly is event? Event is basically a change in state or an update. Uh, that is being uh, an example would be like an item being placed in the shopping cart, or it can be something like, <laughs> and I uh, it can contain data like uh, the state of the system or uh, the identifier and it usually represents the facts that has happened in the system. It There is a, a slight difference between event and a normal user request. That is normally events and commands. Uh, events are something like when a user places an order to our uh, API gateway or to our backend. Uh, that's actually a command. The user... Uh, represents an intent and wants to perform an action and ask to do something. Failures can happen, uh, the order can be rejected, and there would be only one entity consuming it. And there's uh, then um, the API gateway will perform and our backend logics will uh, process the order. Here it's a simple uh, Lambda service. And then when it is done, it is informed to the user. And then uh, we create uh, an event called order created. It is uh, sent to our event uh, broker or messaging system. That order created event is the fact that we have created an order. And uh, it is an immutable information that is it won't be changed or it won't uh, change. And uh, we can select what all events we want to consume. That is the consumers. Uh, uh, we will be build, uh, building a notification service, which would be consuming that order is created. Uh, we should notify the user. And if it is not part of the uh, common tenant or like it is part of a uh, enterprise tenant, uh, the notification should be sent to Slack also. So all those information could be curtailed. And uh, <laughs> we may have multiple different consumers one consumer for notification one consumer for uh, logging into the audit log and all those informations are there that's basically what's the difference between commands and events and here uh, uh, there's an uh, event bridge here what exactly is event bridge it's an amazon service that's basically an event broker event broker are what stand between producers and consumer and uh, it basically uh, is kind of like a uh, middleman that uh, uh, receives all the input informations from the producers and the consumers consume from them or subscribe to their uh, each topics or each subjects that they want to ha handle. And uh, all about this. So what's actually an event-driven architecture? What is it? It's actually a software ar architecture pattern that's built upon production uh, detection, consumption, and reaction to events. It uses events to trigger and communicate between multiple different decoupled services. Here, we usually have three different components. Event producers are uh, some services that create uh, an event and generate an event that something ha has happened to their state and they inform others inform the event broker that uh, a state is changed or an event is created. The event broker is the orchestration layer or the uh, uh, system that is behind all the uh, handling, all the uh, uh, consumption, all the tracking of the request and uh, which all producers are there, which all consumers are there. They may have also persistence like uh, Kafka or Nats Jetstream that they have uh, the store of the structure and we can replay from the start till the end. And uh, 
there are many different patterns uh, uh, usually for, uh, found like event notification system where events are just uh, sent out as notification, no track is record. State uh, event, uh, state carried event uh, system that is basically sending the um, uh, change of states uh, to the uh, as an event and event sourcing system which keeps track of all the events and we can perform a, a replicate all uh, the system and uh, playback we can have a replay of the all the activities that happen this actually uh, used mostly in enterprise scenarios to uh, have a good audit record so that's it so in traditional microservice Says we use without an even uh, system or an even bus or a queue. We uh, all the service usually uh, communicate directly with each other. In event-driven architecture, services push uh, the events to the event router, and they don't care uh, about who the consumer is and what what are they gonna do with the data. They just they are not aware of the consumer. They just are aware of the uh, standard or schema that they define to push. And the uh, consumers uh, pull those events which they want to listen. Service C uh, might want to listen to all the events of service A. Service D might only be uh, only wish to listen to the events of uh, an order create event. Or, and service E might only uh, be interested in uh, receiving critical events. And uh, Mostly, uh, you might have uh, heard or used a few of these tools or heard about them, uh, like Apache Kafka, Nats, uh, RabbitMQ, EventBridge, Google Cloud PubSub, many others are there. Just mentioning a few uh, popular tools. We'll be uh, uh, focusing on uh, trying to develop as uh, using Nats, as it's very simple to set up and get started. And uh, we usually, uh, in large teams, uh, what happens is that we define our events, we send, and we build a system. Then uh, later, we don't have enough documentation, enough uh, information uh, to uh, identify that uh, as a cons consumer, uh, as a person, uh, part of a consumer team, I may not have any information or insight about what's actually the logic uh, they have the written, or uh, there would be a uh, structure so the structure would change in case of uh, rest apis uh, we uh, usually have uh, uh, use open api as our documentation system and we define our apis using open api specification it was previously known as swagger so uh, in open api specification it's mainly intended for request response that is synchronous one to one uh, messaging no uh, and there's no support for asynchronous. Uh, the support uh, for, uh, for web hooks, uh, web hooks are basically an asynchronous system. Uh, that's there from uh, in OpenAPI from uh, version 3.1. All other types of asynchronous uh, interactions are not there. And uh, no type of one to many uh, asynchronous interaction that's mostly seen in uh, our event architecture. That's not present uh, present here. That is, uh, we have one publisher, many consumers. All those uh, patterns are not defined by open API specification. So what if, what if uh, we create an open API standard for asynchronous communication? That's what async API is for. Async API uh, is a project under Linux found, uh, foundation, uh, which is uh, trying to uh, build a similar system as Open API uh, spe specification for asynchronous communication and uh, event-driven architectures, and it is fully compliant with Open API specification. As you can see, that uh, in Open API uh, 3.0, uh, the parts like info uh, we have the same uh, uh, in uh, async API 3.0, the similar system. Here, uh, servers and securities are con combined in async API, and <laughs> Uh, the corresponding thing to parts is basically channels uh, and part item which uh, request is uh, being handled is basically a channel and uh, we have the operations are defined uh, uh, here also we have operations and request and responses con uh, uh, 
is analogous to our message and it contains messages, headers, payloads and message references. And the get pushed, put or post is basically our uh, action that's happening. So similarly, uh, the other components and, and the other specification are also correlated and uh, they have many uh, different but few additions are there. So this is what an uh, async API specification looks like. So uh, here uh, we have uh, something like a simple uh, async API uh, description of writing as simple user sign up e event message. And that's there. So the concern is usually that we have, uh, uh, we are usually creating documentations and uh, for our teams, but usually the documentations uh, don't stay up to date as we are uh, we developers uh, are usually a bit of lazy bit lazy to have something uh, maintaining the documentation come back to developing things and creating new things so uh, the usually the case is that we our documentation are not up to date and uh, that's a, a challenge we have to face so in uh, case of uh, our uh, system, we are, are trying to integrate this async API in, into Python and have an automatically up-to-date system. That's where uh, async API comes in uh, with us. And we are uh, integrating async API into Python using FastStream. The major features of FastStream are uh, it supports multiple brokers it provides a unified api to work across multiple uh, message brokers like kafka rabbitmq redis and it has it level leverages pydantic's validation capability to serialize and validate incoming messages that is we can use pydantic models uh, as the uh, params and uh, responses for our asynchronous events directly and we have an automatically up, updated uh, async API documentation. The documentation would always be gen auto-generated and uh, we can utilize the powerful dependency injection system. It is similar to what's found in our uh, fast, fast APIs uh, dependency in, uh, injection system. It's uh, basically we are uh, using fast depends in uh, our uh, fast stream as a dependency in injection. And we uh, it supports built-in um, uh, in-memory test and uh, making our CI-CD pipeline reliable. And we use, uh, uh, we can extend it uh, to support uh, our own custom implementation. We can uh, use lifespan when the event brokers should start, when it should end. We can create custom middlewares. We can have uh, custom serialization mechanisms. And uh, it's uh, supported with all uh, HTTP frameworks. We can simply use the use uh, what's uh, use basically the uh, lifespan part to start and stop when our uh, API servers are there. In case of fast API, we have a direct integration. Uh, we can directly use uh, the uh, routers uh, fast API uh, routers capability along with our uh, fast stream services. So let's dive into building our first uh, fast stream app. It's very simple to get started. We can uh, uh, create a NATS uh, broker client. We can uh, otherwise use Kafka, RabbitMQ, or Redis, or any other brokers. Currently, uh, it supports uh, on only these four, NATS, Kafka, RabbitMQ, and Redis. And we can define our brokers share the uh, connection url here and just write uh decorate our function uh, uh which handles our request using at broker dot subscribe and the uh, test here is the subject so which subject uh, should our uh consumer or subscriber should listen to that's what basically uh we can uh, add it here and we can also pass in uh, uh, other parameters like middlewares uh, or uh, other documentation related informations. And uh, the base handler uh, variable, uh, currently we, uh, this is a simple app, so it supports a, a simple uh, variable body. And that is the whole uh, response that is received will, will be printed. 
So that's how we define. It's so simple, we can do it in uh, two lines. So to run this, we need uh, to create a fast stream app. Uh, for that, we have to import a uh, fast stream and uh, pass on the uh, broker that we are using and generate app. And here we have defined the NATS broker. We need to run the NATS broker uh, on our system. For that, uh, it's very simple and we can use a simple Docker Compose file to run our uh, NATS event broker. Uh, we just pull the image, set the uh, container name. The ports that are important is basically for triple two. That's where the uh, our system will, uh, our Python app will be connected to the uh, NAT service. A triple two is the monitoring uh, port, which we can use with a various system like a NAT dashboard to analyze how our uh, data packets are being sent. Port uh, six triple two is for uh, making our uh, NAT system into a cluster and connecting with other clusters. Uh, this command minus js is enable Jetstream support Jetstream. It's NATS uh, a persistent layer uh, that we can uh, use and uh, it uh, meant, uh, adding the monitoring port as a triple two. So uh, when we launch our NATS uh, Docker Compose, we can uh, see that uh, it's running. Uh, uh, what, how much memory and CPU load is being used? It's a simple uh, Go application. It uh, is highly efficient in resource uh, usage and we can define which all uh, subscribers are there, how many are connected and we can easily scale. So that's the uh, uh, ability of NADS. So we can run and test, but we missed out something in our code. We, uh, we need to send that. We have only defined the subscriber. We need to send a, a message to our system that we have uh, received the body. So that's uh, uh, something to pass as a producer. So that we can define as uh, as a test subject that is uh, it would run after uh, when the app is started. So it's a one-time application thing. So app dot startup we can define the broker dot publish. We can actually use anywhere in our code to publish our data or events to our system. So to run this, we can write. Uh, fast string run app colon app, similar to how we run Ubicon uh, app app. App is the module name and here we have uh, used app itself as our uh, uh, package name. So uh, it's uh, what we are running. And as I have said, hello Python is, I have what published when the app starts and uh, I print it as received body. So that's what you can see here received hello Python. And uh, it uh, by default turns on all the lo uh, loggers. So uh, uh, it waits for the uh, messages and all the uh, message events with their ID that was received on which subject uh, will be shown as a notification. We can turn it off by simply passing comma uh, logger equal to none or uh, set your own custom uh, logging rules here. So that's it, a uh, uh, very simple application. Now let's integrate uh, with fast API, Pydantic and async API. So to create a simple Pydantic model uh, for this session, I'm just using a simple uh, user ID name uh, as a user mo model, which is defined using uh, Pydantic. And we'll be importing this into our uh, code, currently written code and changing. Instead of uh, in the subscriber, I'm passing user colon annotating with the Pydantic model. Similar to fast API, fast stream also uh, uses annotation to identify what data is there. So if you are uh, uh, send, uh, setting some uh, return value annotation, it will also be validated. So setting something uh, else other than the intended uh, result will uh, obviously result in errors, runtime errors. So it's similar to fast API, how we uh, define our paths. So we can simply use or even use our existing fast API routes and add it as a subscriber by just uh, adding our uh, subscriber, uh, broker subscriber line. So we have uh, defined uh, 
imported the user model and passed it and we can directly use user.name and name so for sending that we'll be sim simply passing that pydantic model uh instead of the uh message we used uh into the subject so that uh pydantic model serialization would be handled by fast stream fast stream would automatically handle how uh it should be serialized into a, a format and uh it would be deserializing the, the similar way here so that's how uh we can uh create a simple pied use a, a simple pydantic model and to create an event producer uh instead of just uh using our uh as a test method we can separately uh create a producer.py file and set uh set something like uh as a simple asynchronous function and use a, an ads broker uh, uh broker and uh, use br.publish command to uh, send our uh, request so so we will be using the same uh, producer file to test all of for integration we need not write it in the same uh, file itself we can use as a sim uh, another service to run the producer so in our uh, usual code bases we would be using only this uh, this lit, uh, uh, simple part so that uh, we can use it anywhere in our code and we will be defining the broker in the global level so that's how uh, we can produce and uh, consume pydantic model so let's integrate it with fast api so, so the fast api integration is pretty simple we just instead of using nats broker we are now using nats uh, router uh, in the fast stream module that uh, we can uh, define the router and include similar to how we include our routers in fast api we will be including one thing that we have to set uh, not forget is set the life uh, lifespan context in the fast api path this is done so that uh, we can uh, start our broker when the fast api application start and stop it when our application stops similarly if we are not using fast api if you are using falcon or any other service we can uh, directly use our uh, nats broker and uh, set the uh, lifespan context of that broker uh, in as a middleware in our falcon application so that it starts when the uh, application starts so uh, this context is sim uh, same for broker and uh, <laughs> router as well so on doing this this is similar so uh, uh, the output will always be similar and we can directly access our uh, data in slash async api uh, path so this path from this path uh, in our fast api application we can see what is uh, what all servers we have defined what all operations we have uh, uh, returned and <laughs> what all uh, models we are or data types we are using so uh, we have uh, defined only a single function that is handle message handle msg and it listens on the subject uh, user register so that's what is uh, written that which subject is handling with uh, uh, by which function that's our operation and what message data it accepts it accepts a user model uh, data and the payload should be user id json similar to what we see in open api specification and uh, the message uh, is uh, detailing our me uh, message payload structure and the schema uh, uh, these two are currently same because we are only using one simple function if you are uh, writing different functions we can see all the payload informations here and uh, different sch uh, schema informations here just as we see in open api spec or uh, as we see uh, types and queries and mutations in graphql uh, schema similar to that we have developed and used our schema so that's how uh, we have uh, used uh, to auto generate our text and there's also there are a lot more things that we have uh, we can explore in fast stream as a simple one uh, before the time is out is uh, we can chain events that is basically firstly uh, we would be sending an event uh, user registry event similar to what we have done and that user registration operation can return back 
a model and publish it to another uh, subject or another topic uh, after processing it uh, it would be basically useful for something like we are uh, keeping uh, a service as a middle uh, a middleware service and it accepts all the incoming events processes it converts it transforms it into another data structure and returns <coughs> returns to uh, as a uh, published topic uh, published event in another topic and uh, the other uh, subscriber can listen and utilize it that's uh, what chaining event uh, is we can easily chain event by uh, just annotating it, uh, a function as publisher uh, publisher uh, in our code base uh, this annotation would only work if there's only uh, uh, already a, subs a subscriber standalone uh, setting a standalone publisher uh, in a function is not supported and uh, we can uh, set as standalone subscriber and uh, have multiple uh, topic we can also ha had multiple sets of subscribers in a single uh, single uh, function uh, that is a single function would be uh, listening to consuming e events from multiple different topics provided they all have similar uh, uh, data type structure that is being passed on and it can only publish to uh, it can only return to one uh, uh, different topic. So uh, that's it. Thank you, guys. Uh, is there any questions? Thank you very much, Abhinand. We've got some time for questions, exactly. If you have any questions, please stand behind the microphones and ask them away. In the meantime, I do have a question. Do you see any pitfalls in event-driven uh, architecture compared to the more usual ones? Yeah, uh, obviously all the architecture patterns have their own uh, benefits and downfalls. Uh, the usual simple uh, pitfall is we cannot easily debug things. So in a normal uh, request re uh, response pattern, we would be easily, we can easily find which a request is uh, have gone through which function, uh, which function we can easily debug. And we can uh, put forward a simple uh, tracing service like Datadog APM or Sentry uh, APM or any other tracer and simply track uh, what's happening there. But uh, in event driven, it's much more complicated. We cannot actually uh, easily debug compared to uh, our a normal request response uh, structures. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what about unit testing? Is it also quite harder to unit test or you mock a lot? Uh, unit test, uh, is it, uh, comparatively, uh, it's harder as uh, we need to know what all events would be fired well. But uh, we can also uh, perform unit test easily as uh, we, we only need to know what all events are coming, uh, uh, what all events our uh, individual service or uh, microservice consumes and produces so we can uh, define a test easily so that which event uh, uh, we can mock and send a few events and uh, what uh, events would it be correspondingly produce we can test and record it and all the state changes and db so it's uh, unit tests are not that much of a problem uh, in eda i believe brilliant thank you so it looks like we exhausted the time and questions, so give it up for Abhinand.